Hello everyone, welcome to today's live broadcast assessing the safety of extractables and leachables for drug products, when and how. I'm Chris Spivey, the Editorial Director of Pharmaceutical Technology, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are pleased to bring you this broadcast presented by Pharmaceutical Technology and sponsored by Nelson Labs. I would like to share a statement from our sponsor. In this webinar, the challenges in toxicological safety assessments for parenteral packaging system applications will be addressed. Typical toxicological challenges for extractables and leachables are presented, such as difficulties in daily exposure evaluations for a selection of compounds to be evaluated based on an appropriate selected threshold. Subsequently, typical burden and hazard and risk evaluation related to data-poor substances often related to rubber closure systems. Within this context, ENL examples are selected for which the critical toxicological endpoints are discussed and evaluated by means of various methods in terms of deriving appropriate safety limits. Before we begin, we have a few announcements that are important to listen to. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small square icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window, or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the event. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. I would now like to introduce today's speakers. We're very pleased to be joined by Kevin Breesh. Kevin Breesh holds a Master's in Science, Biochemical Engineering from the University of Leuven, Belgium. He started his career as a lecturer in total quality management. In 2004, Mr. Bruch took the position of QA QC manager at Toxicon Europe, now Nelson Labs. After implementing the ISO, GMP, and GLP quality systems, he became responsible for the preclinical IND enabling programs. Currently, Mr. Bruch is responsible for managing the toxicological safety assessments related to ENL at Nelson Labs. Thanks very much for joining us today, Kevin. Please get us started. Hello, uh, good day to everyone. My name is uh, Kevin Brees, and I'm uh, the manager for tox assessments uh, for uh, Nelson Labs in Europe. So uh, I'm responsible for all the safety qualifications of uh, extractables and leachables for a drug or medicinal products. And I will be sharing my expertise in uh, when to start such evaluations and uh, how you can do this. I will first start with uh, the concept of uh, ENL. What is the difference between extractable study and a leachable study? Then I will uh, indicate what, uh, what concepts you can apply to evaluate the extractables level, how to uh, assess the clinical relevant exposure of extractables, also uh, to set the limit uh, from which level on uh, these extractables can become a concern and how you uh, translate that to an, uh, an analytical reporting limit, uh, the AET value. Further on, we will uh, conclude with the toxicological assessments of leachables uh, themselves and the three hurdles uh, to be taken uh, being mutagenicity, irritation and sensitization, and finally the permissible daily exposure. So first, what is the difference between an extractable and, and, and leachable study? With an extractable study, we test the container closure materials. So the drug product is not involved yet. We're going to boil these materials in clean solvents like pH, uh, different pH values of water, ethanol, ethanol water, isopropanol, hexane, uh, what is deemed necessary. And we will see what 
is in this material because what is in there can potentially migrate uh, out of it and to become uh, a leachable. So we want to know what is in there. Obviously, we need to identify it in order to be able to uh, to assess it for from a toxicological point of view later on. And worst case conditions are applied. So uh, we will use elevated temperature to extract as much as possible from the material. We will be using screening methodologies uh, for uh, Headspace GC, GCMS and LCMS. Since we don't know what we are uh, looking for, uh, we want to screen for vo volatiles, semi-volatiles, non-volatiles as, as, as broad as possible. Then moving to uh, the follow-up, the, the leachable study, where we actually analyze the drug product itself after a uh, long-term storage. So we want to know what does actually migrate from the material into the drug product. And there we want also to focus on the, the quantification. How much is the patient being exposed to? And this is being done. These uh, drug products are stored at uh, normal conditions, intended use. And we will be screening still. Uh, since we don't know if there is any interaction uh, between, we also don't know which extractables will become leachables. Um, but we can also fully validate uh, a method in a drug product to fully quantitate uh, this extractable which became leachable. So uh, let's start with uh, assessing the, the extractables data. So from a worst case scenario, we can assume that all extractables will end up in the patient. This is obviously not the case, but one could assume this. Or we can try to uh, extrapolate the extractables data towards a more clinical relevant exposure level. Uh, we do that by using uh, the ISO standard uh, uh, total exaggeration factor. So we try to quantitate how much times uh, the extraction conditions were exaggerated compared to uh, the clinical uh, use. And we need to assess all the compounds above the safety uh, concern threshold. This is a nominal value, how much micrograms a day a person can get and how to convert it to an analytical evaluation threshold, uh, a concentration in the extract or in the drug product itself. Uh, being called the analytical evaluation threshold. Um, what is important to mention is that you cannot stop your safety evaluation after uh, an extractable study. Um, the whole goal is to, to, to claim or to, to provide evidence that the material is compatible with the drug product. And since extractable is done with, uh, with solvents, there is no way to predict if there is any interaction with the drug product itself. So you would still be having a gap there. Um, not all extractables, luckily, will become leachable. So are we doing already a full safety assessment on all extractables? I would say no. Uh, sometimes we have more than 100, up to 200 extractables uh, identified. It would be very time consuming uh, and costly to do this. And not every extractable will become leachable, so you will be doing some unnecessary work. Uh, for medical device, it's a different story. You do a chemical characterization study, also an extractable study, but there is no leaching into a drug product. So with medical devices, you will have to uh, assess all the extractables. Um, what I do recommend is to do a, a preliminary uh, assessment. The whole goal is to demonstrate if there are extractables of concern that these do not migrate into the drug product or become leachable at a concentration which does pose a risk to the patient. So what we do there is the, a fit analysis, a fast initial toxicity assessment using uh, QSAR methodologies, Derek uh, in our case, to rank the compounds uh, based on their uh, inherent toxicity. Also, uh, an interesting question, should we validate uh, the analytical method? The easy answer is yes, but also 
validating all extractables in uh, in the drug product uh, would be very time uh, consuming and costly. So, <clears throat> first, let's see if we can extrapolate the extraction conditions to have a more clinical relevant uh, exposure assessment. This is also always a little bit uh, risk based, obviously. Um, this uh, this example is about uh, a black O-ring, uh, which is used to close the, the vaporizer, um, which vaporizes the drug product and the rubber ring closes the, the 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 mouth piece so there is limited contact between this rubber closure and the drug product being inhaled by by the patient so different uh, extraction uh, solvents were applied and uh, you can choose for, um, a solvent which is predictive uh, meaning it would mimic the extraction propensities of the drug product so that you have a predictive leachable profile already at the extractable level. So therefore, we uh, selected 1% ethanol in uh, in water because the uh, API was uh, about 0.6% uh, organic content. We extracted at 50 degrees for 72 hours, uh, and we are going to extrapolate this to uh, to a clinical relevant condition. So for the temperature, we extracted at 50 degrees. Normally, a patient would be using this uh, at home between 20 and 25 degrees. Um, so obviously, there will come out more extractables at 50 degrees than, uh, than it would be at 20 degrees. And uh, the Arrhenius equation gives you a mean to assess how much less is expected to come out. This is based on the, the diffusion rate, uh, uh, which is uh, linked to the temperature. Um, the equation is, uh, is, is, is uh, listed there. So if you uh, put in there the 50 degrees and the 20 degrees, you would uh, you would end up with uh, with a factor of 5.7, meaning that you would extract 5.7 more times extractables. Uh, than at the 20 degree uh, level. So we exaggerated here, let's say five times. Time, we extracted 72 hours. Uh, let's say as an example here, four treatments a day. You have to inhale it for, uh, for five minutes. So there is an exposure of 20 minutes a day. And this mouthpiece and uh, an O-ring needs to re be replaced every 30 days. So in total, you could say there's 600 minutes of contact time and equivalent to 10 hours. So you could say the ring was 7.2 times longer extracted than during actual clinical use. Now, we know that uh, it's not a, a linear uh, relationship between uh, time and the amount extracted. As you can see in this, uh, this graph here, after time, you will reach an equilibrium, a plateau. So uh, this is 16 hours, meaning that uh, if you would go from 72 hours to eight hours, you would be uh, exposed to the same amount of, uh, of extractables. Going into the lower time, uh, time periods, uh, because we have to, in the end, we have to assess how much is exposed to a patient in a day. So it's 20 minutes. So here, it's reasonable to argue it will be a lot less than after 72 hours. Um, <clears throat> so it's always a, a little bit of a, of a risk assessment, which you have to justify. And we, uh, we took an exaggeration factor of three. Also, the surface area, um, which is being exposed to the patient, um, we incubated this O-ring uh, completely, so there's 100% of the area being extracted. Um, you have also to take into account if you extracted five rings, so it would be five times more what you uh, would uh, extract. Um, in a clinical condition, there is very limited uh, contact area um, between uh, between the the drug product. And, and this O-ring because it's completely tightly screwed. 
Also there we took the uh, put the risk assessment. What if it's not correctly screwed? Uh, let's say 50% of this O-ring can be uh, uh, area can be exposed to the drug product, giving us an exaggeration factor of two. So the total exaggeration factor would be 30, meaning the extractable concentrations and clinical relevant uh, scenario would could be let's say 30 times lower. Then setting the limit from uh, which level on we need to uh, report and identify uh, and assess these extractables. Uh, same same concepts uh, are valid for extractables as for uh, as for leachables. Um, the most safe uh, threshold is 1.5 micrograms per day. Any given compound at 1.5 micrograms a day being exposed as a patient every day in your life does not pose any uh, significant risk. Um, where does it come from? Uh, it's, a, it's an old study of gold at all. Um, they put together 730 carcinogens and they made an evaluation uh, that 1.5 micrograms per day uh, for most genotoxic uh, carcinogens is not likely to exceed lifetime cancer risk of 1 in 100,000. Um, where, where is this coming from? Or how do, do we can uh, calculate this back to uh, a TD50 value because this is what is used. This is the uh, exposure by which 50% of the animals develop tumors. So if you have a TD50 value of uh, 1.5 micrograms a day, that's expressed in, a, in an animal model, typically the rat, you multiply it by the human body weight, 50 kilograms. So we have 75 milligrams per day, which leads to one in two persons to develop tumors. Uh, what is acceptable? Risk in one in 100,000. So we have to divide this level by 50,000 and we come up with uh, 1.5 micrograms a day. Um, as you will see, it is being used by the PQRI as well as the ICH M7 guideline. So if you have a mutagenic carcinogen, it's a class three, it will be, it has to be controlled at 1.5 micrograms a day. Um, ICH M7, which is designed to evaluate the mutagenic potential of uh, impurities, how you should assess that. Also, for a lifetime, they have the same value up until 1.5 micrograms a day. There's a negligible, negligible risk for carcinogenicity. Um, what is sometimes uh, confusing is uh, that the ICH has higher thresholds. So if you have a, a, a short therapy, like for an antibiotic, uh, your levels can uh, go up to 120 micrograms a day which is true, but only for mutagenic impurities. Um, sensitizers and irritants are class two, need to be controlled at five micrograms a day. Nevertheless, the duration of the therapy. And then you have uh, compounds of class one, which are not considered to be uh, carcinogen, mutagen, sensitizer, irritant, should be safe at a level of 50 micrograms a day but that's currently being under discussion and it's, uh, it's not always accepted. To understand this, uh, this concept of toxicology, uh, <clears throat> often uh, they say the dose is the poison, uh, which is true. So the uh, concentration of a given chemical uh, times the exposure uh, will give a constant toxicological effect. So if you give the half of concentration of a chemical for twice the time, you will uh, have the same toxicological effect. So uh, applying this to the ICHM7 uh, for lifetime being uh, 70 years, you can have 1.5 micrograms a day. So 
1.5 times 25,000 days should be the same as one day having an exposure of 38.3 milligrams, which you can see here. Uh, obviously, this is not the case. Um, they have additional safety factors up to a le level of 300. So it is really very conservative, uh, this threshold of 1.5 micrograms a day. But you see that you can go up to 10 years, you can have 10 micrograms of a mutagenic impurity. If dosing is uh, up to uh, one year, it's 20 micrograms a day, and less than one month, it's 120 micrograms a day. So coming back to, uh, to the safety concern threshold, if you start your uh, reporting limit uh, calculations or uh, designing your extractable study, it's always safe to start from 1.5 micrograms a day uh, what can go into the patient. Um, 120 for short duration never apply this. You're always stuck with the, with the 5 micrograms a day since you have to evaluate sensitization and irritation from that level. Um, and the general toxicity assessment is actually also uh, being put forward as qualify it uh, from 5 micrograms a day. This is the general toxicity um, which has to be assessed. So this is a very important message for chronic treatments. The qualification threshold where you have to identify and qualify your impurity is set at 1.5 micrograms a day. For all other treatments you can go up to uh, uh, 5 micrograms a day. Um, we need to be able to identify the compound in order to evaluate is there any mutagenic potential. Uh, also to evaluate the permissible daily exposures, looking for uh, toxicity studies, uh, repeat dose studies. We need to have an identified compound. So an example here uh, to calculate an analytical evaluation threshold. We are considering a vial with a rubber stopper. Filling volume is 1 ml. Maximum daily intake is 1 vial per day or 1 ml per day. And we want to calculate the analytical evaluation threshold. So as mentioned, safety concern threshold, we put that 1.5 micrograms a day. We are exposing the patient with one dose a day. And for each, uh, for one test item, one stopper uh, or one container, uh, it contains one dose. 1 ml. So the AET would be 1.5 micrograms per test item or per stopper in your extractable study. Um, we apply an uncertainty factor of 50%. This is done because we are doing screening methodologies. It's not uh, fully validated uh, analytical methods because we again we don't know what we will be uh, what we will be uh, identifying. So it's, it's, it's semi-quantitative. That's why we put the reporting level, level uh, uh, on the half of, of the AET. So the final AET is the half of the calculated AET. Being in this case 0 0.5 micrograms per test item or for extractables, uh, the stopper. So how are you analyzing this? What is your reporting limit? Imagine in, uh, in this example that we are extracting five stoppers in 100 ml. We know we can have up to 0 0.5 micrograms uh, in one stopper. So we do times five stoppers divided by 100 ml and your final AED, which is a concentration in the extract, your reporting limit would be 37.5 micrograms per liter. So you see there is an uncertainty budget here. Uh, not only apply to the reporting level, but since it's semi-quantitative, this uncertainty budget, uh, you can also consider to apply to the, to the actual result which you are observing. Um, so meaning that if you see an, ex uh, an extractable at 37 micrograms a liter, you can put it at uh, 75 micrograms a liter to be conservative. 
Um, <clears throat> there are some some challenges, for instance, uh, in large volume parentals. Um, so let's let's say we're calculating the final AED starting off of a of a vaccine, a syringe, a small volume parenteral. Um, we put the, the safety concern at 1.5 micrograms a day. We inject one ml. So the estimated analytical evaluation threshold for the leachables then is 1.5 microgram per ml, including your uncertainty 0.75 micrograms per ml. In a large volume parenteral, the same thresholds uh, can apply uh, for chronic uh, treatments. But if we are dosing one liter a day, you will see that the uh, analytical evaluation threshold is thousand times lower. And that might not be analytically feasible anymore, depending on the metric. So what, what can be done at that point? Um, you can involve a toxicologist and say, well, this threshold of toxicological concern, this is valid for any given chemical compound. Uh, we are looking at compound X, so let's uh, derive a permissible daily exposure for compound X. How much can a patient have of compound X uh, on a daily basis? Imagine it's derived to be 4,850 micrograms a day. You come up with a more feasible uh, level of 4.85 micrograms ml. So, Remember that I said it's important to demonstrate that uh, an extractable doesn't leach at the, con at the concentration which, which poses a concern. Uh, the PDE is, is, is the level of concern. So here you see, uh, let's say, an, a, a leachable profile. And for uh, a small volume parenteral, you can put the AET here at 0 0.75. You have one, two, three, four compounds to evaluate doable. If you go 10,000 uh, times lower, it becomes almost a nightmare because you have to identify all these compounds. Um, so what you can do is uh, look at your extractables data, see which compounds are uh, of concern and inject it into your blank matrix uh, at the AET. For instance, if you see it at the AET level, you're good, meaning that your methods are sensitive uh, enough. Um, if you don't see it, you can spike at a higher limit at the, the PDE level. If you see the PDE level in your blank matrix, this compound, and you compare it with your leachables, and it is uh, substantially lower, you're still in a, in, a safe, uh, in a safe case. So this is what we called, or what we call method suitability testing. Yeah, if, if if you don't see anything in your uh, leachables profile, FDA will ask you dem demonstrate that your analytical methodology were adequate or sensitive enough to pick up these leachables uh, at the AET. So we spike these compounds of concern in the blank drug product matrix to demonstrate if they would be there at the level of the AET or for that matter at the PDE level, uh, we would be able to pick it up. Going to the, uh, to the leachables profile, uh, this is actually uh, the compounds which end up in a patient. Worst case scenario here is really the maximum daily dose. This is the first thing and also the length of, uh, of therapy. Uh, is it two weeks? Uh, can it be repeated uh, 100 times? Uh, what is the cumul cumulative uh, uh, days of exposure of that given uh, drug product? This, this is information you need to have. So we will be assessing the, the highest level uh, observed across the shelf life. Um, so that highest level, when this uh, product is being dosed to the patient, uh, we have evaluated the, the highest exposure. Again, we have to assess uh, the compounds above the safety concern threshold. And then the, the question may rise, uh, can we start a tox assessment only at the end of shelf life? Personally, um, it becomes very critical. And eh? the, the, the leachable program is finished. Uh, you want to move to the, uh, to the market as soon as possible, get your approval. Um, if you, you 
evaluate the leachables profile only at the end. And uh, you have to overcome these three hurdles, uh, mutagenicity, sensitization, or, or, or a permissible daily exposure. And you have concentrations above these hurdles, which you are not able to, to waive these, uh, these risks, you will have to do additional studies. And that will, uh, that will delay the whole, uh, the whole process. So, <clears throat> hurdle one, mutagenic potential. We have to assess that. Um, obviously, we will look into literature for mutagenicity information. What you would like to look for is the OECD 471. It's the AIMS assay or the bacterial reverse mutation test. I will pick up in, uh, in, in this test because it's very important. Um, when it's positive, it is a mutagenic. Uh, there is a, a likelihood that you will find carcinogenicity data. So remember this uh, turmeric dose where 50% of the animals uh, give, uh, give rise to a tumor development, and you can extrapolate this one to have an uh, acceptable daily intake. When it's negative, your uh, AIMS uh, assay which was performed, you can go to hurdle two. Uh, when no data is available, uh, we refer to the ICHM7 for uh, QSAR prediction models. Um, going to the, the AIMS assay, so what is what is being done there? This is a Petri dish and we will uh, put uh, uh, bacteria on them, but uh, special uh, bacteria. So uh, these are Salmonella strains or E. coli strains, which have a gene knocked out, that uh, they are uh, they are histidine dependent. Normally, they are not, but we made them, we changed them to be or to become histidine dependent. Um, so it's a mutation of this microorganism. Um, what we do is we put a little bit of, uh, of histidine in a, in a Petri dish and we put the, uh, the test compound uh, on top of these microorganisms on the Petri dish. And also we put uh, a liver homogenate. Um, so this is uh, containing all the SIP enzymes responsible for metabolizing uh, the test compound, uh, the extractables or the leachables, because it may be the case that uh, the compound as such is not mutagenic, but when it's metabolized, it can become mutagenic. So we put them on an agar plate, we incubate them, and in order for them to be able to, to grow and to divide and copy their uh, DNA uh, from one microorganism into another, we put a little bit of histidine in there, because remember, they were made histidine dependent. Once this uh, histidine is depleted, they shouldn't be able to grow unless they have been mutating. Uh, and if they are mutating, they are no longer requiring this histidine and they will grow. Like here, a lot of colonies uh, can be counted here. This is seen as positive. They are able to grow uh, without histidine, so they are back and mutate. Um, like I said, if the mutagenicity uh, AIMS data is not available, of course you can perform this test. Uh, alternatively, you can refer to, uh, to prediction uh, software models, um, so-called QSAR systems. So they are looking at structural activity relationships. There are uh, rule-based in combination of a statistical-based uh, system you have to apply. Uh, here you see also five strains, so five different strains, a combination of E. coli and Salmonella, and they find alerting uh, structures like aromatic uh, amine or an amide. And then they come up with a, with a reasoning, well, since this aromatic amine is there, mutagenicity is plausible or probable. Uh, the other system uh, I use is multi-case. This is a statistical uh, assessment. So this portion or this uh, functional group of a, of, an, uh, of a molecule is present maybe, let's say, in 100 compounds. If this 
compound is positive in more than 60 compounds, uh, because you're <clears throat> maybe one step back, so you are you don't have data on this uh, on this molecular structure. Uh, so you are comparing with a database of up to 15, 20,000 uh, structures which do have uh, toxicological information. And based on the structure, you're going to compare uh, similar compounds and based on the mutagenicity data for these similar compounds, you're going to make a prediction. So if more than 60% of the compounds containing this, uh, this feature uh, are positive, the probability uh, will be positive. If both are positive, you are dealing with uh, an assumed mutagenic uh, compound. If both are negative, um, then only then you have a negative uh, mutagenicity um, evidence. Alternative uh, QSAR systems are LeadScope, SARA, tox OECD uh, toolbox. Um, I have been uh, evaluating uh, a number of those in, in the beginning. And my experience is that Derek and Multicase uh, are pretty much in line. So this is what, uh, what I typically use. This is an example, a summary output, uh, what we put in our FIT uh, analysis and this fast initial toxicity assessment. So for every compound in our database, we, we run the Derek Nexus uh, uh, software model. And here, for instance, the, the brominated uh, short rubber oligomer, uh, the prediction is that carcinogenicity in human is plausible, but also uh, mutagenicity in these bacteria is plausible. And even uh, sensitization, skin sensitization in human is plausible. So we uh, classify it as a, as a class three, which should be controlled at 1.5 micrograms a day. So if you have this one in your uh, extractables profile, this is a compound you would definitely want to be monitoring in your, uh, in your leachables. Um, <clears throat> this is... Uh, straight out of the, the ICH M7. So if you have a compound which is known to be a mutagenic carcinogen, uh, you can derive a, a specific uh, limit based on the turmeric dose for 50% uh, of the animals. Um, if it's a known mutagen, you don't need to do uh, an AIMS or a prediction model. It's, it's known in literature that it's uh, mutagenic. So you need to control it at the uh, TTC, uh, the ICH uh, threshold of toxicological concern going from 1.5 up to 120 micrograms a day, only for mutagenicity. Uh, alerting structure unrelated to the structure of the drug substance, uh, no mutagenicity data. This is uh, uh, not really relevant, let's say, because leachables are, are not related to the, to the drug substance uh, typically. Um, but what you then do is uh, accept the, the thresholds of toxicological concern or perform the uh, mutagenicity assay. Is it positive? You're back to uh, square two. Is it negative? Then you can treat it as a, as a non-mutagenic uh, impurity. If it's non-mutagenic, uh, then you can uh, go further to, uh, to assess the channel toxicity information, which you will have... Uh, no way else and no adverse effect level being observed in the repeat dose study. So that's the lowest level which do not generate any toxicity uh, signs. Or you can uh, maintain the, the, ge the general qualification threshold of five micrograms a day, um, or you can do a read across. Read across means that uh, there is no repeat dose study on, uh, on this specific compound. So also there, you're going to look for a highly similar compound with same functional groups and uh, structure and, and molecular weight. Um, and you have to write a very good justification before uh, uh, they will accept this. But you can perform a read across to make uh, an assumption, a justified uh, uh, PDE level. Hurdle number two. The sensitization and irritation, uh, which is to be controlled uh, at five micrograms a day. 
We will be looking at the uh, OECD 429 local lymph node assay or the guinea pig maximization uh, test. Um, so there you will see they they apply different concentrations uh, of the pure substance uh, to the animal to see if there is any uh, uh, sensitization uh, observed. OECD 404 for skin irritation. Here you can see also they apply 0.5 grams of a of a pure substance uh, to the skin of a of a rabbit in this case, and they evaluate uh, irritation after uh, after 14 days. Um, <clears throat> you irritation often you can find uh, the local lymph node assay is, is is less often available, but what you can see is that it's concentration it's concentration based, and they have uh, strong irritants and they have strong sensitizers, but also weak ones. Um, so that information might be used uh, to de-risk uh, that potential at, at leachable concentrations. If there's no data available, we can revert uh, again to QSAR systems. Um, there's no guarantee that they will, uh, will, will accept it. They do accept it for mutagenicity. Um, I was reading uh, when I was preparing this presentation an old guideline from 92 where it was stated that quantitative structure activity relationship are not yet sufficiently developed to play a significant role in the assessment of skin sensitization potential. That was true 30 years ago. Um, I, I do use it in, uh, in, in my assessments as a, an additional weight of, of evidence. Um, but again, there has been limited uh, occasions where it was not accepted. You can also conduct a test. These tests are not uh, that expensive on the, on the pure substance. If it's not available, you could consider to make an extract of the material, analyze it, see that it's a higher level in the extract being exposed to the animal than, than in the actual uh, drug product. Um, what I do have to say is also for the for the medical devices, where they uh, uh, explain also the threshold for toxicological concern. There they are very clear uh, for irritation and sensitization. You're not allowed to fall back on literature or, or QSAR systems. So for medical devices, you have to perform the compatibility test. Then hurdle three. Um, so if the compound is non-mutagenic, you have uh, evaluated that uh, that the irritation sensitization is not of a of a relevant risk at that level. Um, you have to go and to repeat those uh, toxicity studies. Um, so it typically starts from 14 day, 28 day uh, repeat. Those studies are are most common, um, but also longer studies. Um, reproductive and developmental toxicity studies are also uh, available, although uh, shorter of duration. You have to, if you're, if you're evaluating uh, a toxicity study of 28 days and uh, your exposure of your impurity uh, is, is, is for, let's say, a year, then one month repeated dose uh, information might not be enough uh, to qualify uh, or to be used for for the period your therapy is doing uh, is, is, is taking. So what they do is uh, they have different safety factors. Uh, interspecies uh, is, is, is F1, so extrapolate from from a from a rat to uh, to to a human. Uh, there's a safety factor. Maybe you have a dog study. If you have a monkey study, which will most likely not be the case, um, the safety factor becomes lower. There is also intraspecies um, uh, variation between any person, you and me. There's a there could be a different level uh, which we are tolerating uh, um, an, uh, an exposure of uh, impurity. So these are all factors uh, between one and ten. Also, the quality of the data, duration of the study, uh, this is all being built in. You start from a no effect level, a safe level in animals, expressed in micro um, milligrams, typically uh, uh, per kilogram body weight. You do a weight adjustment, you evaluate all the, the tox data you have and the quality of the tox data and the time, 
and you come up with uh, permissible daily exposure, um, which is relevant for, for your drug product. Also, the uh, the route of administration is, is important. If you have a, uh, an oral study, uh, for instance, a 28-day oral study, and your drug product is an injectable, you would like to have some bioavailability data because not all oral uh, absorbed uh, chemicals go into systemic circulation. And this is what we need to assess in a talk study. It has to be going into the bloodstream, being able to affect every organ. All these organs are evaluated in these uh, repeat dose studies. So you have to make an assessment also there. And that can, can help you um, to raise the, the PDE level. If, um, if the absorption is, is very high and everything goes into systemic circulation, uh, if it's low, then uh, it can be more complicated to qualify the compound. Typically, if you have oral, uh, if you don't have bioavailability data, uh, an additional safety factor of uh, 10 is used if you're extrapolating from oral to an IV safe dose. Uh, <clears throat> an example here is uh, an extractable study from a bromobutyl stopper, like I mentioned also in the, the Derrick evaluation. So and the oligomers come out, uh, it's a bromobutyl uh, stopper, so we have the brominated rubber oligomer. Um, let's say we're dosing 100 ml a day, but, uh, provided in uh, five bottles of 20 ml then. Um, so five stoppers uh, are being exposed to the patient. Uh, so we find 15 micrograms uh, per stopper, maximum exposure is five stoppers a day, we know that uh, that the uh, mutagenic potential is real, so you should be controlling it at 1.5 micrograms a day. Then you see that your safety margin is 0.02, so below one. Um, how do we get there? Uh, it's easy enough. It's 1.5 divided by 75. So. If you can overrule mutagen uh, mutagenic potential, if you can overrule sensitization potential, remember, I'm not uh, using any anymore this uh, general tox uh, safety limit of five, 15 micrograms a day. We always uh, uh, derive a permissible daily exposure. Uh, this is for information purposes only. This 150 might not be true. So, but. Imagine you can justify uh, 150 micrograms a day as being a, a, a safe dose, then your safety limit becomes, or safety margin becomes two. Uh, so then you can qualify this compound. So you see you have to take these hurdles, mutagenicity first, sensitization, irritation, and then general talks or the permissible daily exposure. Uh, if you do this at the end of shelf life and you find that at that after one year already, you're not able to make it a, your permissible daily exposure is lower than your actual exposure in your drug product. You might have to do additional testing or replace uh, your material. Um, this is what I already explained. <clears throat> so uh, hereby I, I like to conclude with my uh, introduction of uh, how and when we can uh, use toxicity information in, in your ENL program. I'm from Nelson Labs uh, in, in Europe. Um, Nelson Labs is uh, worldwide present uh, and is part of the Sotera Health Group as is Sterigenics, which you might know from uh, sterilization uh, solutions, as well as uh, Nordion for uh, supplying of Cobalt uh, 60. Please check out our website for additional uh, educational uh, information and, uh, and events. I thank you for your attention. Thanks Good very morning, much. everyone. Kevin, for such an informative and practically oriented presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I'd like to remind our audience how to submit these questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found in the upper right-hand side of the presentation window. And the first question is, 
can you explain to me the total exaggeration factor? And is there any guideline how to apply such extrapolation? Yeah. Um, so the total exaggeration factor is, uh, is like I gave in this example, the combination of uh, exaggerations of uh, temperature, time, and uh, surface uh, uh, to volume ratio in, uh, in your extract. And uh, you can... Uh, you can multiply all these ex exaggeration factors to obtain a, a total exaggeration factor. Now, that's, and that's coming from the ISO 10993-18 uh, medical device uh, chemical characterization guideline. And um, you have to be very careful applying these. You cannot just uh, put it in a, in a calculation box like, like this. It has to be justified. Um, it's it's a risk-based uh, approach to to assess how much of these extractables you have uh, found in your extract are clinically relevant and assumed to be uh, exposed to the patient. So it's a it's an extrapolation. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, could you please elaborate the next question on how the PDE level can be used to assess the need for method validation? Yeah, that's something what, uh, what comes up regularly. Uh, you have uh, performed the extractable studies. Um, and then the question is, do we need to uh, validate uh, an analytical method for that uh, targeted uh, extractable? The easy answer is, is, is yes. Uh, the, the more quantitative uh, your leachable uh, result is, uh, uh, the better it is for the safety assessment. Um, but you cannot possibly validate all extractables. So uh, if you if you see in your leachable screening that an extractable uh, is actually becoming a leachable, then you can consider going into to validation. But imagine that you observe semi-quantitatively, let's say, 10 micrograms uh, a day. Uh, it's above the 1.5 microgram uh, threshold, so you could consider to go uh, into validation. But if you do uh, the PDE calculation um, and you observe it's safe up until 1,000 micrograms a day, just as a, a generic example, well, then there's no much relevance or additional uh, uh, value in, in performing a method validation since uh, it can be 100 times higher and still be, be safe. So in, in that perspective, the, the PDE value can, can help you to decide whether or not uh, you should do additional method validation. No, that's excellent. That's another very practical answer. Uh, the next question. At which clinical stages uh, do regulatory agencies expect to view the ENL data in clinical trial application? Um, it's phase three, uh, as I recall it. Um, but as far, yeah, let's say that uh, we always recommend to start together with your um, stability, uh, formal stability studies, if you have selected uh, uh, your container closure. You have to have already some, some some data before you going into formal stability studies. So the sooner the sooner you start, the better. Um, submitting it uh, end of phase two B uh, for sure. I would uh, I would say. Perfect. That's very helpful. Uh, the next question: Is there a guidance for what PEF should be used in extractables studies? Uh, well, the, the best guideline uh, would be the USP 1663 uh, for pharmaceutical containers. That is the guideline uh, how you design an, uh, an, an, an extractable study, how you select the, uh, the solvents, uh, which techniques you uh, apply. Um, that's the USP 1663. And the 16.4, uh, 1664 is uh, on the leachables. Perfect. Uh, PDE values and TI slash TE values correlate. Excuse me? Uh, correlate. 
yeah, tolerable intake and uh, tolerable exposure. Um, it's a different uh, type of calculation. Um, the PDE uh, calculation is in the ICH uh, Q3C, and uh, it's typically used for uh, for chemicals, such as in this the, the pharmaceutical drug product. So it's the PDE calculation for medical devices. Um, they have the tolerable uh, intake, and it's a, a slight different approach, but uh, the, the let's say the the overall concept is is the same. You start off with the with a, a no AL from a, from a tox study, uh, you, you compensate it by body weight and you divide it by uh, by the safety factors or modification factors based on interspecies uh, which uh, animal was uh, was selected for the tox study, uh, duration of uh, exposure. These time these things are 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 in the um, are divided to uh, to reduce this. Uh, permissible daily exposure or tolerable intake uh, level to make it more uh, conservative. That's fantastic. So we're running out of time, but we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, the next question, what if QSARs present us with contradictory results? Can you repeat it, please? Yes, I'm sorry. What if QSAR present us with a contradictory result? So I'm not sure. Ah, QSAR. With the QSAR. Okay, okay, okay. So okay. <clears throat> yeah, that uh, that happens. So um, you uh, you run a rule-based system and you run a, a statistical-based uh, prediction model. And uh, if one or, or two, if if they have a conflict, one says uh, positive. Let's say uh, Derek says uh, it's negative for mutagenicity, but uh, Sarah says it's positive for mutagenicity. Um, then the overall conclusion should be that you consider it as a mutagenic uh, impurity. Um, that's not that's not nice, but that's not the end of the world either. Um, if you have a positive, uh, you can uh, look for a, a carcinogenicity study and. Uh, if there's a turmeric dose 50 uh, available, you can do the linear interpolation. Um, alternatively, you can uh, you can still perform the uh, the AIMS assay, uh, and that would be then the, the final evidence whether or not uh, the impurity would be mutagenic, yes or no. So that's a nice segue to the next question. Um, are there ways to ahead of time sort of or common ways to identify false negatives for an AIMS assay test? Well, uh, I've been involved in setting up the AIMS assay. I'm uh, I'm not an an expert in uh, detecting false negatives. Uh, I remember that there is something like a background long, uh, so like micro colonies in the background. But that's something uh, yeah, that's that should be addressed for by a by an expert in, in running an interpretation of uh, AIMS results. Well, that's a good answer, thank you. I think this could be our last question we have time for. Could you please elaborate on how the PDE level can be used to assess the need for method validation? I think that question was already, uh, already okay. asked. Terrific, go to the next one then. Um, there's currently, due to the pandemic, a shortage of animals for testing, animal model tests. Have, have you got recommendations for alternatives? I know that uh, some people are using uh, quite uh, strange animal models in a pinch. Uh, I have been personally confronted uh, with, uh, with that uh, issue as well. Um, reverting to uh, uh, in vitro um, test that that can be an option. It would probably, uh, yeah, the acceptability is, is something I cannot uh, I cannot comment on because I haven't used uh, in my uh, assessments uh, uh, in vitro uh, for um, yeah, I have no. And then yeah, you have to. Uh, to try to get a, a slot with the, with the CRO, and indeed, yeah, if my study was postponed for uh, for, mo for over a year almost. So uh, 
I think everyone is uh, is having that uh, that issue. Yeah, okay. I, it's better to know that everybody's going through the same thing. It's a very difficult time. So unfortunately, yeah. we're out of time for today. Um, I really appreciate how practical um, your presentation was. Uh, it's uh, very informative. Thank you, Kevin. I want to thank the audience also for attending and for participating in today's event. And I'd like to thank our sponsor, Nelson Labs, for making today's educational webcast possible. We would like to ask everyone in the audience to participate in a brief survey. You can see the survey at the bottom right of your screen. You'll receive an email alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thanks very much to everybody for joining, and we'll see you next time. Thank you and goodbye.